the facing point lock rod, this rod here you can just see, bent around and has two bolts securing it through to the switch rail. We have our switch extension piece here, as you can see, which goes off to our detection. Now that is insulated down there by two rubber bushes, or alternatively by the old uh, fibre washers. There's different ways of doing that and there'll be a ferrule insert in there if there isn't um, a rubber bush. With the switch extension pieces, obviously, as I probably mentioned before, one offsets the other. So, for instance, um, you, you can't really see it, but on some of them there will be four holes, so you can set them forward and backwards so that one rod sits behind the other. So this one's obviously set out very far forward on its front two holes. You can see here the distance between that back bolt and the back of the back of the switch extension piece isn't very far. Whereas if you look on that side there, the distance between that bolt and the back of the extension piece is much further. So that rod's, that rod's been pushed back further. On the set of points, again with the insulation side, this is the insulation side on these set of points here. So you'll notice you've got the insulation plate, you'll notice there is an insulated bush there, big washer, big fibre washer. Uh, in front of that is a steel washer and then the nut itself. Inside there is a uh, insulated ferrule. It goes about as far as there. This plate is designed with a hole big enough that the ferrule will just fit into it. So that this bolt here, when it goes through the back, back of the switch, back of the switch extension piece, it doesn't touch this plate here and therefore short the track circuit out. <clears throat> and that's quite important. You'll notice on this set of points we put the front insulation on this side but you'll notice all the four foot rods insulations on that side. If you look very carefully our drive comes in on this side so if we tried to put that insulated uh, stretcher that way round it would foul the drive. That's why the insulated rods are on that side, that's insulated side but we put insulation on this side just to get around that problem for now keep the drive there. If we put it on the other side as well it wouldn't have helped. Um, we've got some issues with the bushes on the other side so hence it's gone on this side. Again as I mentioned when you come to fit these uh, inside the bushes in here it's not a case of hammering them in. Terrible idea you'll just damage them. What you need to do is align the switch obviously you can't move the switch that much align the switch extension plate to the switch it's the, uh, the FPL rod, you might need to just lift it gently to get it aligned with the switch. When these two are aligned, you can slowly slide the bush in a bit at a time. And an old trick here is to use an old bolt, a redundant bolt, one you're throwing away, one that's been hammered and gnarled up. You can use that gently, just as a push through. Um, you could get your pin bar in from the front, but the problem with the pin bar is quite long and thin. You really need quite a thick pin bar to just align this and this to get your ferrule in. Uh, it's a very delicate process, take your time with it, uh, and then you'll get them in. Regarding the shoes themselves, if you notice there are two types of shoes. This is a flat bottom rail and has a flat bottom shoe which has a longer foot on it there, it's clear. I'll show you a, um, a bullhead shoe in a minute, and that's got a much, much thinner gap on it there. Shoes tend to have a little bit of cracking damage here after a few years of heavy mainline use, bear in mind. Everything out of railways tend to get is second hand, so you need to be careful that your assets are intact and not damaged. So having a look at the shoe here, there's no crack marks on there. Um, we still use the standard old bolts, though we have been moving towards the uh, hexagonal bolts and they're much better. Um, watch out for the threads on these. You want a minimum of two threads. Um, that tends to be a standard. You don't always get that with the square bolts. But again, we check these for tightness and security. Try and get your heads aligned on the bolts on the back. Otherwise, if the switch rail starts to ride, it will catch under here. One problem to be aware of with any set of points, especially trap points, is your switch itself drifting uh, either backwards or forwards. Uh, obviously, you can see here, this is sat nicely square to the end of the slide chair. Uh, if you start to get very short switches, so this is the trap point here, what you can get is it can drift because there's nothing behind anchoring it or you can get long sections of curved rail pushing that switch and you'll end up with this drifting right off the front and as it drifts right off the front what will happen is your rod starts to get very close you notice that rod's below and it's still got clearance there but if those are two separate rods they can short out there at the bottom and cause a track circuit ball. Uh, other issues you tend to get 
when you start to get drift on the switch rail, you start to get drift on the facing point lock rod. And what you will get is you'll get the facing point lock rod starting to get very close to the face of the facing point lock and jamming. And there's a gap there, so that's all right. It really wants to be a bit further back, but this is a set of traps. And obviously you can see it's drifted in the heat of the summer. Uh, the only way around that is to really get the P-way to pull the switches back, which means taking several of the keys, uh, several of the um, fish plates loosened and, and jacking it back. So you've got to be a bit wary of that, a bit careful of that. Um, also, what you don't want is you don't want the facing point lock uh, not going back far enough, so you've got to be careful on that, um, because otherwise it will jam the, jam the switch. That's another issue. That... When it comes to setting up points, as you can see, this is a double end set of points on a curve. So what we have here, we have our trap end, and down there we have our far end. You notice the rodding's on a curve. Both ends are reasonably lightweight, and it's about a 200, 150, 200 yard pull. Uh, both levers worked off, uh, sorry, both points worked off the same lever. The far end, because it's under 10 yards from the signal box, it's right outside the signal box, doesn't need a compensator. Uh, however, this end does, because it's over the distance. And yet both ends compensate beautifully and work beautifully, because they've been set up properly. Now, if you notice, the lever has around about seven, seven and a half inches of stroke on it. Um, the points at the far end, four and a half inches of movement, where you go between stock rail and switch rail. So obviously you have to lose that movement somewhere. And that's what the adjustable crank, the last crank, is for. Now you'll notice, this is the far end, how little stroke we've got on that crank. If you come to set a point and you're having to constantly alter the stroke, there's something wrong. And that usually means there's something loose where it's losing it and it will have a knock-on effect to every single thing afterwards. So you notice how little stroke there is on that. That's quite a very lightweight set of points. Some points you'll come to, the stroke arm is right out here and you start asking questions why it's right out there. It shouldn't be right out there. It should be somewhere near the middle. When you set the points up, you set them up with the points half and half. All your cranks square. So this is not fully square, it's, it's off one way. So your points will be square, halfway. The compensator arms should be equal. So 30, roughly 13 inches, of, uh, 13 and a half inches between. So your crank arms and your compensators are equal and your lever half and half in the box. So that's everything half. Lever half, crank arms square on your compensator, crank at the end, your adjustable crank halfway, your points halfway. At that point, you cut this final closure rod. And that's your final closure rod that you cut. Don't forget, most people do, you also want your adjuster halfway, so you've got good thread on either side, so you can take it either way should you need it. If you have to adjust this set of points, if, say for instance, they're very light up there and there's a gap, and they're very hard up here, you start with your precise adjustment, your PA screws, so you're doing slight adjustment. Um, let's say, for instance, in that case, it's, it's just a little bit off there, and it is fitting up there, and when we stick our spanner down here, it's not very heavy at all, so it's not that it's, it's overstroking, it's not that it's too heavy, it just needs a little bit of adjustment. That's done on the precise adjustment, the PA screws. If, however, those points are hardly moving up one way and absolutely ramming over the other, that's overstroke in one direction. Check your stroke crank and obviously then check anything for looseness and that's how you set the points up. This is our bullhead rail and this is our bullhead shoe. You notice there at the bottom it's actually got uh, quite a lot less um, of a gap here. You can just see there, that's less of a gap than the flat bottom one. When it comes to setting up the drilling dimensions for the four foot rod, what we have are a couple of things that are quite useful to us. Traditionally, this was always done with the permanent weigh department who were in charge of the rods originally, and they did the drilling dimensions to a chart that they had as they knew the type of rail, etc., that was in use. Latterly, that was handed over in 1970s, 1980s to the S&T, and admittedly, what we did at the time was we copied the rods that were there. Um, that wasn't the right process at all. And there is actually a drilling dimension chart that you're supposed to follow. Now we have facts and figure tables that tell us uh, the dimensions, the holes, and the setting up of the switches. So we will bar the switch open so that we have a set dimension there, and then we will drill the holes through there, mark and drill the holes. What we traditionally do, they are on the two types of rail. If it's a an RT60, which is a more modern network rail type of rail, um, you tend to have a 60 mil gap at the back stretcher on the back, on the rear. If it's a UIC 54, which this is, 
or that kind of the old poundage rail and the 13 pound rail etc uic 54 all that kind of stuff you have a 50 mil gap at the back there on the rear stretcher so here we have our stretcher and we should have a minimum 50 mil there any less than that what happens is as your train's going through it starts to kick the back of the switch and leave wear marks and of course that kicking of the switch kicks on the shoes and the rods these are removable so something's got to give it either bends here or it starts to damage the bolts and that's the, the clear giveaways so when you check your rods there and you check your bolts for tightness um, it can cause split marks and crack marks through and we have had that in the past so maintaining your, your flange way there is quite important when it comes to the drilling there are charts available that tell you the dimensions of the gap opening there so you can set the rods to mark them and drill them one thing you need to know is the type of switch. Now on most heritage railways, we don't all have back drives that drive the rear open. Um, some, some just have front two rods, some have three rods depending on the switch. It tends to be under a B switch. Uh, an A or a B switch, you certainly don't have three rods. Anything over, you do. Uh, again, there's nothing fluid in this, you know, different railways do different practices. So we need to know what type of switch this is. And a good giveaway here, whether it's inclined or vertical, we'll find the back chairs. Here we go. It'll either be stamped on here, or it'll be stamped on here. And if we look very carefully, we notice it's a B switch, vertical. So that gives us our drilling dimensions. Uh, slips and diamonds are a slight bit different. Slips and diamonds actually have different shoes that are designed for this. They have a slight uh, kinker angle in them. But traditionally what you can get is you can get plates that are put behind here, the wedge plates, that offset the shoe slightly. As you can see, so on a set of slips or diamonds, this coming in of the rail here won't be as smooth as that curve there that you see. It will be more of an angular inwards movement. And of course that angular inwards means that this face here isn't parallel. So then we need the wedge plates behind our equipment there to, uh, to, to get that nicely offset otherwise these rods end up coming in at a, a right uh, right angle and bending and uh, that's not very good when it meets with the switch rails at the end because it drives everything forwards uh, one thing you can get on some points we haven't got on these you can get alignment plates sat behind for the uh, the bolts these don't have alignment plates on them a useful bit of information for the s t here especially from our side where we have to fix things you notice the chair screws here are stamped this has an S in it, some of them have AS and some have M's. Uh, you start off with a standard screw, which is these, and when this starts to go wide, you start to put AS's in, above standards, and then when it goes wider again, you end up with M's in for maintenance screws. Now at that point you start wanting to change timbers because things are starting to go wide. You'll notice the gauge stock here is designed to stop this drifting out uh, to a certain degree. Sometimes you will find these plates are second-hand on most heritage railways and they use what fits. There are different dimensions for the plates, so you need to make sure you've got the correct plate. With the FPL, again, and I'll give you a hint here, um, when fitting FPLs, fitting with screws, not bolts, please. Bolts stop them moving, fair enough, but it also stops you floating this detector should you need to do a very fine adjustment on this when you can't get around other ways. One of the things we used to do in the old S&T was if we couldn't get the adjustments to suit till the P-Way changed to timber, what we used to do is loosen the four chair screws, which floats the facing point lock, and you can very slightly jig it backwards and forwards just to give you that small gap should you need it. Say like the, the switch has drifted over and everything's gone out of kilter, because obviously that means you need a new FPL rod and you need the sole plate changing at that point and the timber, so it's quite a big job. But if you've bolted these down with three quarter bolts, the holes are three quarter holes through them, you've no chance because you've now removed any bit of movement you've got in there. So use large chair screws, not small chair screws, and certainly not three quarter bolts. Three quarter bolts, if you've got a set of clamp locks, fine for mounting the centre thrust bracket down, great. Stops anything moving. You know, 2,000 pounds of pressure on a set of clamp locks. A little bit different on a set of mechanicals. They want to be chair screws, not bolts. Otherwise you will end up catching yourself up in the future.